This is a recording of Chapter 10 of Survive, The Atlantis Braille, book by Vera Nazarian. What happens next is a flurry of activity. While Aysen and I wait, the Imperator calls his staff and orders cars ready for a sudden trip downtown. He barks orders in a cutting tone at his wrist calm, then motions for us to follow him out of his red office. Moments later, we are surrounded by Imperial guards, and we rush after the Imperator through the hallways of the Imperial quarters. In the central grand lobby at the elevators, Aysen's own guards join our group, hanging back somewhat, to give the Imperator's personal guards precedence, and we continue moving into another doorway that leads in the opposite direction from the lobby and deeper again into the same level of the palace. Many hallways, servants scattering out of the way and confusing turns later. A corridor opens into another, smaller, marble and gold trimmed lobby, also equipped with elevators. We take the elevators there, but instead of descending, we continue up to the roof of the palace. I have not been to the specific portion of the roof. The Imperial Palace complex is sprawling and huge. Not a single structure, but a many-tiered grouping, with flat and angled rooftops topping various buildings, and this particular roof area appears to serve as a landing hover pad. I notice it's located far away from the elegant open-air pavilion where I had my first Eos bread and met my future in-laws on my first full day in Atlantis, because I can barely make out the colonnades of the pavilion in the distance, at least four rooftop tiers away through the white haze of hell's light. Crisp wind washes over us, and bright morning sunlight strikes us with a fierce white glare. Aeson pauses momentarily to take my hand, pulling me toward him, then hands me a pair of wraparound sunglasses. Squinting, I put them on, feeling immediate relief, and continue moving, holding him by the hand as we are loaded into hover cars. At least six gleaming metal vehicles await us, levitating two feet above the surface. The Imperator commands us to his own large, private car with an opulent, dimly lit interior and unexpectedly takes a seat in the very front next to his own staff driver who handles the task of flying our vehicle. Meanwhile, I end up next to Aysen in the second row of seats and the guards pile in behind us in the third and fourth rows in the very back. All through this, the Imperator doesn't say a word to his son or to me. He only addresses the driver with a curt command. To the stadion, quickly. And then he stares out the indigo-tinted, translucent, anti-glare window, ignoring all of us, his gaze straining forward, his fierce, handsome profile stilled in darkness. We lift off, and the palace rooftops fall away in a gilded radiance of mauve, red, and black-trimmed marble as we rise into the blindingly incandescent sky flying toward Poseidon city center. All this time, Aeson's large, comfortable comforting hand continues to cover mine. I find that I am barely breathing, numb and frozen, while we fly over the now familiar city landmarks, with no one speaking. Soon I see the radiance of gold that is the Grail Monument rising up in the distance. Now that I know what it actually is, for the first time my mind perceives the blazing vision and properly interprets it filling it the gestalt of the continuation of the grail underneath the ground so that I can vi almost visualize it, the giant archship buried deep beneath the city. The Imperator directs his driver to land us right inside the empty stadion arena at the foot of the grail. As soon as the vehicle doors open, I hear the deep, bone-jarring hum, feel its low vibration sweep over my body. We get out of the hover car in haste. Aysen and I carefully step onto the arena floor and exchange glances, while the Imperator practically leaps out ahead of us and issues commands in a draconian voice. The Imperial Guards are told to make sure no one else is in the area and to clear out the premises of any grounds restoration staff or other employees. No one is to be allowed here, do you understand? The Imperator tells them. Not even this building security. I want them all out. Inform them this is a mandatory safety inspection before we begin the reconstruction cleanup. All but two of the guards immediately spread out across the vacant expanse and disappear inside the corridors of the nearby buildings. 
The two remaining guards step back discreetly to a polite distance that is well out of hearing range. I watch them conversing on their wrist comms with the others who are elsewhere in the complex. Come, the Imperator tells us meanwhile, and begins walking toward the grail, stepping over the cracks in the ground and the uprooted building material lining the floor of the arena. We follow, stepping carefully over the crumbling sections underfoot, over what looks like concrete and rock and layers of twisted metal. Oh my god, I did this. My breath shudders as I test my footing before each step. The grandiose golden stem portion of the grail rises into the sky above us. Curving upward, it expands into the immense round bowl section that casts a circular shadow. Instead of looking up at it, I stare at what's on the ground in front of me. The barely convex horizontal stand por portion, which is the outer surface of the main hull, the buried bulk of the arc ship. Come, come! Romotat beckons angrily with his hand as he steps onto the golden curving surface. Hasten walks after him and I follow. My perception of the humming vibration increases exponentially the moment I make direct contact. It enters my body through my feet, and I feel my teeth rattle with a horrible buzzing. It occurs to me, I am standing on top of the ancient ship. At once I am overwhelmed by the strange wonder, the implications. Not only does it affect all my physical senses, but it stirs the mind with a cascading depth of emotion. Ahead of me, the Imperator walks a few more steps along the golden curvature and stops at the base of the immense upright column, at least ten feet in diameter at the slimmest point that constitutes the rising goblet stem. He puts both hands against the stem, fingers splayed and digging in with intensity like frustrated dragon claws. He lowers his head and closes his eyes and then begins to sing the keying sequence. C. E. G. His dark, deep voice does not require amplification as it echoes with power throughout the stadium, bringing immediate silence. We listen with rapt attention, and the guards listen from afar as he follows the keen command with the intricate imperial oral block sequence that resounds with eerie beauty. The ship responds. Moments later, the resulting sonic blast we experience at this proximity feels like a small explosion. Asen grabs my arm just to keep me from falling, while I huddle against him and put my hands over my ears as though that would help. Surely this cannot be healthy, at least not prolonged exposure to such sound. Ugh. The grail is now silent. Only the local birds continue to screech and flap their wings as they rise into the sky all around us. Poor birds. The Imperator remains in the same position, head still down, eyes closed, hands splayed against the arc ship's surface. It almost looks as if he's praying. And then he takes in a harsh breath and looks up, glancing at his son and at me. The light of hell paints his face with washed-out pallor. Note the time, he says to Asen. We wait and time it, the interval of silence until, if, it begins again. Asen glances at his wrist and marks the time on his multifunction calm gadget. I watch his movements, frowning with tension behind the illusion of privacy of my wraparound glasses. Unfortunately, it does not take long. Only a few minutes later, the hum returns, swelling from the ground, filling us with its excruciating rattle. Seven daydreams and eighteen heartbeats, Asen says in Atlanteo, which, if I recall correctly, is the approximate Atlantean equivalent of 7 minutes and 18 seconds. In one of my weird mental asides, I recall out of the blue that this oddball term referring to a minute, roughly translated as daydream or reverie, was never officially used by anyone during the games. It has archaic connotations and, according to my Atlantean instructors, is being phased out in favor of actual Earth minutes to both modernize and integrate the two populations. Meanwhile, heartbeat, the term for a second, is still persistently used by the general population. In any case, apparently the Imperator likes using this old form, and Asen accommodates him. Or maybe for some reason they need this level of old-school precision for whatever measurements are associated with the, with the ancient arc ship, and Earth-style minutes just won't do. 
while my stupid thoughts nervously ramble the imperator nods to his son then redirects his dark stare at me gwen lark it has come to this i will now teach you the imperial oral block let's see how capable you really are and that's how for the next 20 minutes or daydreams or better yet nightmares I am treated to the dubious honor of a private voice lesson from the Archeon Imperator of Atlantida himself. Romutat is a ruthless instructor. He makes me repeat notes and sequences over and over, correcting me harshly at the smallest imperfection of tone and pitch. The command sequence is not particularly long, but it is very complex, so it takes a while until I can undo the whole, uh, until I can echo the whole thing back correctly. Asen listens and observes us, and I'm certain he's silently learning the sequence for himself. At last, I am more or less ready. Place your hands on the ship, the Imperator tells me. Feel it. Know it. Become one with it. I don't care how you choose to focus your energy, just do it. What is it you, Gebi, do to focus? Meditation, you call it? Meditate, if you must, or pray to your Gebi gods. I nod silently and rest my numb fingers against the vibrating gold metal of the grail. I should probably stop thinking of it as the grail. It's a ship, a great ancient relic of metal alloy and other artificial material that has traveled across the universe. It's an object from Earth. My breath catches and my heart starts to pound with this sudden basic realization. But before I can begin the keying process, one of the guards approaches, and the Imperator steps aside to talk to him. Asen and I stare with worry because the Imperator has a deeper frown when he comes back, while the guard departs to his original security distance. What? Asen asks. His father shakes his head with annoyance. Reports of protesters gathering outside the complex. Apparently the public is concerned with the sonic activity here, and also the game's nonsense. They're chanting for the final champion ceremony, demanding we resume tonight or tomorrow. Also, the media is out there snooping, trying to interview the evacuated staff. Just what we need. The timing cannot be worse, Asen says. But something must be concluded as far as the games. You'll have to give him something, unless you want to explain all this. The Imperator makes a disdain disdainful hiss and curses in Atlanteo then once again turns to me. All right, girl, are you ready? Proceed. Don't think, just don't think it. Do it. I take several deep breaths and focus, clenching my hands into fists while I sing the commands in a clear, perfect voice stripped of any emotion. When I'm done, the result is silence. Then comes the same rising shriek, culminating in the awful sonic boom and more silence. More flapping, screeching birds. Good. Time it, the Imperator tells Asen, who nods. Here we go again. I stand breathing, hearing the pulse beat racing in my temples while minutes pass. The Imperator slowly walks around the stem portion of the goblet, glancing around periodically into the distance at the guards at the buildings of the complex. Asen just stands next to me with his arms folded and waits. How much time has passed? I asked Imam Revu nervously. About 15 daydreams, uh, minutes if you prefer, he says, checking his wrist. So far so good. Okay, I mutter. Maybe it worked? Let's hope so for all our sakes, he replies in a calming voice. But about a minute later, the humming returns, rising from the ground underneath like an ocean swell. My heart jumps painfully. From Hutat Cassiope stops his pacing and makes a harsh, angry sound. So much for your bride's vocal abilities, he hisses. We have a serious problem. How much time elapsed? Sixteen daydreams and twelve heartbeats. It lasted a bit longer this time. How much good it does us? The Imperator looks around again, noting the guards with their stoic expressions, working hard at pretending that nothing is out of the ordinary. Then he looks at his son with an evaluating stare. Your turn, boy. Asen raises one brow. Don't dawdle now. I know you memorized the sequence, too. Let's see how well you can perform at least one of your future official duties. 
Do it now. And Asen begins singing the command sequence impeccably. When he's done and his haunting, gorgeous baritone goes silent, the ship reacts as usual. Silence, rising screech, sonic boom, silence again. Without needing to be told, Asen notes the time. We wait. Twenty minutes later, the terrible humming sound is back. It becomes obvious now the arc ship will not be silenced. The rest of the morning turns into a painful farce. The Imperator does not permit us to leave the stadium and attempts various other voice commands. He teaches them to Asen and me and forces us to key the ship and execute each one over and over and over again. Our voices are getting such a long workout that guards are sent to bring us drinking water based with a special soothing tonic for the throat and vocal cords. At some point after initial hesitation and some pointed arguments, Asen and his father sing the imperial oral block together, their dual logos voices cutting into me with incredible power that sends goosebumps along my skin and seems to carve up the arena in the sky, land, and air with subtle vibrations. The guards listen, equally rapt with attention, the impact of the plural logos voice felt by everyone. The ship obeys and is complacent and inert for over an hour, which makes everyone think it finally worked so that we even return to the cars and sit inside comfortably waiting. But then, just as the Imperator decides it's safely over, the humming sound returns stubbornly eternal. The Imperator cusses and jumps out of the hover car. Both of you, come, he tells Asen and me. And so we get out and climb back over the broken ground and place our hands over the golden stem. This time we do the plural voice as a chorus of three Logos voices. The power and beauty of the sound we make is hard to describe. My rich alto mixes with their two profound baritones, forming a river of glorious sound that swells into a cosmic scale sound ocean and fills the stadion and the surrounding area with a strange, almost tangible sonic structure. As I sing my own part, I feel our tonal intertwining happening in real time, particle wave strings of energy and matter being pulled into artful constructs. And I understand suddenly, while multiple Logos voices join together in song, are a dangerous thing. Not only have we keyed the massive ship beneath us, but apparently we have keyed the entire stadium complex. Somehow I'm certain of it. I can feel it. Everything that has any trace of orichalcum content in the immediate vicinity is now connected to us on a bizarre, personal quantum level. It is all ours to control, if we choose. <laughs>